Hello and welcome to the studio. My name is Joseph Lim, the host of the episode of a new podcast series produced by HRNK. Today's episode is titled The Disappeared. We'll be talking about North Korean abductions of Korean and Japanese nationals. HRNK produced a report titled Taken in 2011, documenting North Korea's extensive criminal abductions of citizens of other countries. In the vast majority of the cases, North Korea has denied any role in the disappearances of such people, while the families and friends of the disappeared have been left in perpetual limbo. Grasping at any trickle of information about the livelihoods of their abducted loved ones and long waiting for the return. The report is on the HRK website, which link we have put below, and its content will be dealt by, by the wonderful three panelists we have in the studio today, who are all interns at HRK this summer. Without further ado, Julia, would you like to start us off with an introduction of yourself? Yes, thank you, Joseph. Hi, everyone. My name is Julia Campbell, and I'm a junior at Indiana University Bloomington. Uh, I major in East Asian languages and cultures with a focus on Korean, and today I will be discussing the cases of the Japanese abductions. Cool. Amanda? Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Amanda Lechner, and I'm a junior at Virginia Tech, majoring in national security and foreign affairs, and minoring in Japanese studies. I'll be handling the cases of Korean abductees today. Oh, so you're the perfect candidates to discuss these issues today. So, okay. And finally, we'll have it on to Sumin. Greetings, everyone. My name is Sumin An, and I am an alumni from George Mason University with completion of global affairs major and minor in conflict analysis. I am delighted to be here to share about how the Japanese government has been handling abduction issues with North Korea. Thank you, Sumin. It's a pleasure to have all of you in the office today. So without further ado, then, we'll go into section one of our discussion today, and let's dive in. Julia, uh, our question for you for today's topic is, in the case of Japan, there were 17 official disappearances by the North Korean kidnappers. Who disappeared and how? Yeah, so there were 30 Japanese citizens who were abducted by the North Korean regime, but only 17 of the names are known. And these include uh, Kenzo Kozumi. But before I go on, I just want to put out a disclaimer. Kenzo Kozumi is suspected to have been kidnapped by North Korea, but it's not 100% confirmed. So I have his name down because he was first on the list, like I believe it was 1961, but they're pretty sure it was North Korea, but not 100% sure. And the rest of the names are 100%. Takeshi Terakoshi, Yutaka Kume, Megumi Yao, Megumi Yokota, Yeko Taguchi, Yasushi Kaimira and his fiance Fuki Hamamoto, Keoru Hozuke and his girlfriend Yukiko Okudo, Suichi Ichikawa, Riko Masumoto, Hitomi Sogo and her mother Miyoshi Sogo, Taraki Hara, Keiko Arimoto, Toru Ishioka, and Keoru Matsuki. And abductees were taken by a few different means. For instance, some were taken very violently, while others were lured to North Korea and ended up getting stuck there. Some Japanese citizens liked the Tuche ideology of the North Korean regime, and for those of you who don't know, Tuche is self-reliance, and that is what the North Korean regime highly emphasizes in their government. The abductees that were taken violently were usually tied up, gagged, and thrown onto a ship that sailed to North Korea. So. In the case of Megumi Yokota, she was 13 years old. She was on her way home from badminton practice, and they took her, put her on a ship, and locked her in storage. Uh, what was the purpose of abductions for Japanese citizens? Okay. Yeah, uh, so North Korea kidnapped many individuals to help improve their country's national interest. And by this, I mean North Korea needed intellectuals to make up for their deficit of resources and knowledge, as well as train North Korean spies in subjects such as foreign language for espionage. So in the case of Yeko Taguchi, one of the Japanese abductees, she was forced to teach North Korean terrorist Kim Hyun-ni Japanese language and culture. And because of this, Kim was able to blend in as a Japanese tourist, and she was responsible for the bombing of Korean airline flight 858 resulting in the deaths of 95 passengers and 20 crew members. So it was a huge tragedy. And the reason that she was able to was because of the skills that she learned. But you know, it's important to note that uh, Yiko Toguchi had no choice in this matter. She had to teach her Japanese. Gotcha. I think that leads to the next question over here. And um, Amanda, it's not only the Japanese that were abducted, and you've been exploring the Korean cases. Is the way that the Japanese kidnapped similar to how Koreans were kidnapped by North Korea, in your opinion? 
there, there was a wide range of ways um, people were abducted. I, I, I first want to note about people that were lured to North Korea, specifically ethnic Koreans in Japan after World War II. Uh, there was over 2 million ethnic Koreans in Japan after World War II. About 1.5 million of them were descendants of people in South Korea, while about 30 to 40,000 of them were North Korean region descent. And so in that, in Japan, they had these general associations is what it translated to, but they're called chongnan. And basically they functioned as their own government within Japan or their own little society, right? They had their own hospitals, their own banks, and you know, that bank would directly feed money back to the North Korean regime. And I specifically want to touch on schools because they had such a huge impact on how people were lured back to North Korea. Specifically in those schools, they would teach Juche philosophy, the loyalty to the regime, and specifically the Kim lineage to children. And so that's why I think schools had such a huge impact on the later project. They had to have people return. Mm, and I guess the question that I'm going to ask to Amanda is something that we've touched so far. I think it comes down to why did North Korea systemically abduct all these people? Um. Yeah, so after the end of World War II, there's a specific date as well. So on July 31st, 1946, Kim Il-sung himself ordered, to solve the shortage of intellectuals, we have to bring intellectuals from South Korea. This was a foreshadowing to the heinous abductions we have and will continue to discuss today. Um, and I, I would like to recognize that in June, there was a direct order from the military of North Korea saying we need to abduct southern nationals, right? So that was a direct target, specifically ones that were considered intellectuals or of high prestige. And by October of 1950, only five months later, 82,000 nationals were abducted. But the key thing is only 20,000 of them were considered to be intellectuals. And while it doesn't really matter whether someone was considered an intellectual or not in the case of abducting a person because you're taking away their rights, it's just kind of interesting how that was the direct claim, but they still continue to abduct people that were not considered intellectuals. So Amanda, can you tell me more about the Resident Korean Returnees Project? Yeah, I can. So. After the Korean War ended, many of the ethnic Koreans were urged to return by Japan. And they were constantly told, North Korea is going to be a paradise. You'll have so many opportunities there. And so at the start of the project in 1960, about 50,000 returned. Um, but this slowly dwindled. And this is because slowly as peop more people came to North Korea, they would get letters back saying, you know, don't come here. It, the conditions are false. Um, it's not good. And this project didn't end until 1984, so it still happened, it was just less people that were um, going through this program. And I specifically wanted to touch on one case, Chong Kie. He came at the beginning of the project, so this was at the beginning. You would think at the beginning the conditions would be perfect, um, but he first saw this vessel that was a former Soviet Union vessel that looked beautiful and pristine, but when he came inside, he was met with wretched conditions. And strong odors, there was no refrigerator, even though it was summertime. And at that moment, he realized, okay, maybe something's wrong here. But then this kind of thought process continued when he got to the dock and was greeted by people saying, may you live a long life. Um, and, you know, the North Korean people were very sickly then and they didn't look so good. So he realized, maybe I fell for this facade and this propaganda by North Korea. Mm. That's a Wow, that's, that's a horrible story. In a way that he was deceived by the North Korean state to, to go there uh, to discover this reality. And I guess, moving on from that, Julia, what happened to the kidnapped people? Um, how were they treated in North Korea? Certain abductees were treated better than others. Uh, for example, Megumi Yao. She was part of the schools that Amanda was talking about earlier that taught Tuche. So she went there willingly. So she had a luxurious living situation when she first arrived. But unfortunately, later, she was forcefully married to a Japanese terrorist from the Yodogo group and experienced a lot of abuse from her husband. And the Yodogo group is another group of people who supported the North Korean regime's agenda, and they were a terrorist group from Japan. Other abductees did not receive as good treatment as the others. Like Amanda mentioned earlier, the 
Korean Japanese abductees were lured to North Korea with the promise of paradise, but that certainly was not the case. Uh, they were under constant surveillance and were told to tell on each other. So if someone did something, tell the government what that person did. And they were often forced to watch public executions. And earlier Amanda mentioned the case of Chong Kihye, an ethnic Korean. And he was later arrested because he was spying, even though he actually wasn't. And he was tortured until he confessed that he was a spy. So they made him confess to a crime he did not commit. So how do we know the story of um, Chong Kihye? So uh, in December of 1993, Chong Kihye actually decided he was going to escape the horrid conditions of North Korea, and he fled to China, leaving his wife and five children behind. Later, he went to South Korea. He sent them letters. He thought he could come back for his family, but in his memoir, he never mentions his family, so that probably didn't happen. Um, so, I mean, in my knowledge, uh, it's only until about the 1990s when I think the Japanese government did anything about the disappeared people. What do you know about how, what the Japanese government did? when the disappearances were happening. Yeah, so it's crazy how many negotiations and plannings they had to go through with North Korea. Um, the two parties had their first meeting only in 2002, and until then, the media or the government didn't even recognize this issue, and the people thought that it was not the conflict that they would ever think of with North Korea. It was only acknowledged when it was exposed by a former North Korean spy. And in fact, it was the people in Japan who started the campaigns to let the government hear their voices. Meanwhile, like the Japanese government tried several ways to negotiate, or they waited for answers from North Korea, and North Korea denied it until the late 2002. In September 17, 2002, the Japanese Prime Minister Jinjiro Kozumi visited North Korea to have a meeting with Kim Jong-il. Until 2002, there was no process regarding the abductees issue, and it was surprising to hear that it is still an ongoing issue as well. Mm. So, wow, it was only until decades later when the Japanese government actually did anything, right? Right. So, I believe the leader was of North Korea back then was Kim Jong-un at the time, and he released some people, from what I recall. Um, what led him to make that decision to release some of the abductees who he abducted? So Koizumi then met with Kim Jong-il again in 2004 and it was not only concerning with the security issues as their continued nuclear programs but to negotiate on other meetings for abductees. And during the meetings, Kim said, as a host, I regret that we had to make the Prime Minister of Japan come to Pyongyang so early in the morning in order to open a new chapter in the DPRK-Japan relationship. And in this meeting, Koizumi asked him to arrange a meeting with the survival of the T's and also asked for their apology. Kim also explained why this matter happened and he said, I won't promise again. He claimed that the five of the T's were still alive. Julia, can you recall the name of the five? Yeah, so that the five the five abductees that he actually sent back to Japan were Yasushi and uh, Fuki Kaimira. Uh, Keoru and Yukiko Hazuke and Hitomi Soga. Thank you. So North Korea claimed that the eight other abductees were dead, but even with the proof given, the Japanese government have said that their ashes or their personal belongings were not there. The information was totally wrong. And after the meeting in 2004, they had another negotiation in 2006, and same response were given saying that they were all returned and they will not further investigate and until 2007 both parties have not proceeded on the issue mm. so there's there's been not much effort right wow i'm so surprised that they don't want to further investigate that's shocking to me mm. yeah and so time just passes and these people will get older and I think yeah. maybe i don't know maybe the idea is that people will, maybe north korean regime thinks that people forget about these people and that they'll yeah. I think that's why this podcast is so important. It's so like people don't forget. Yeah. Thank you, Sumin, Julia, and Amanda for enlightening all of us about the purposes of the abductions, how, what manner they were, they took place, and how the abductees were treated. 
Um, using this opportunity, we also want to uplift the case of David Snedden. He's a former student from Brigham Young University who was potentially highly likely kidnapped by North Korean agents to teach English in North Korea. And my question to all of you is, if the U.S. government were to bring him back, how can it do so, knowing what we know about Japanese and Korean abduction play cases? And I think, um, Julia, could you start us off? Uh, yeah. So I think that the United States government would first have to meet with North Korea and have a summit. But North Korea would also have to admit to guilt of kidnapping David Snedden. And as we've seen in previous cases in the North Korean regime, they do not like to admit the crimes they have committed. For example, they denied taking Miyoshi Soga when they took Katomi Soga. And earlier we talked about, or Suman mentioned it, that like 13 of the Japanese people, the North Korean re regime, admitted guilt to taking 13. But we know for her fact that there are 17 names and 30 people total. So I think the most important thing is the, uh, that admittance of guilt is the first step. Mm -hmm. Amanda, do you have? Yeah, yeah um, before interning with HRNK, I had no idea about this case. Neither did I. I. I think that shows that you know the United States should put more pressure on North Korea, but also bring it to light to our citizens and make us aware that this happened or that they need to investigate in order to not only maintain his rights as a citizen of the U.S., but also make sure we're investigating it so that we can figure out what has happened and hold whoever um, is responsible to that standard. Yeah, and he's a citizen of our country, so if the government doesn't try to do anything to get him back, that just is not good for the United States image and what we stand for as a country and a democracy. I guess, assuming, I think it would be helpful if you could elaborate on the history of the Japanese government's efforts that followed Koizumi's term as a way of seeing how a negotiation of bringing back David Snedden could look like. As time passed, the Japanese government became more pressure and the action towards Kim Jong-il and saying that the issue is still not solved mm -hmm. and they will like raise more action. And both parties agree that it will be North Korea's job to do the investigations. And in 2008, Fukuda became the prime minister. So North Korea could not continue their investigation and they wanted to examine agreements after changes of administration. And of course, the process were like delayed again. And it was only in 2014 when there was an intergovernmental consultation, North Korea made a vow that they would provide a full-scale investigation. And so, do you think that those settlements produced any tangible results? Or? It's still at the end. Um, while the Japanese government demanded for a safe return for the abductees, um, North Korea mentioned that they will give like specific investigation to focus on physical evidences. They also provided that they're working with National Defense Commission, which is also like known to include like special agencies. Um, still, in 2016, North Korea were like focusing on like their own missile launch, and <clears throat> no actions like were made in like North Korea, even like when they had like the agreements. So it is still an ongoing issue, even when like. Um, when the Prime Minister Abe mentioned it, like during like the Pyeongchang Olympic, and there was like still no changes, and mm. it was not solved. Mm. But it's, it's pretty discouraging to hear that despite all the efforts made by the Japanese government, there, there's North Korea wasn't willing or um, just stalled any negotiations and outcomes whatsoever. And so, but hopefully this can change in the near future as well. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we'll take a short 30 second break with an advertisement of a new HRNK International Bar Association report and meet you back for our second session. Uh, for the audience, hope you can like our video and subscribe to our channel to see more of this content to be produced. Welcome back all. Uh, in this section, we'll be introducing documentaries, reports, or books that we think will be helpful in aiding you, the audience, uh, in furthering your knowledge on the subject. Um, 
My recommendation to the audience is an hour-long documentary by the YouTube channel Real Stories titled Abducted by North Korea. So I think this documentary is special because in one scene it shows you a museum with a real North Korean spy boat that the Japanese captured from the Battle of Amami Oshima in 2001. So basically what happened is the Japanese Coast Guard engaged in six-hour firefights with a North Korean spy ship, sank it near the Japanese island of Amami Oshima, and later the Japanese government recovered the boat for a public display. And you can really get a glimpse of how North Korea conducted its abduction operations via the sea. Um, it also has an extensive interview with Charles Jenkins, uh, who talks about the Romanian painter Donia Bumbea, who was also abducted by North Korea, and um, and she befriended him there. And lastly, it captures footage of Megumi Yokota's mother, Saiki, um, sen uh, sending radio messages to me through a broadcasting station in Japan. And the documentary really shows a moment where North Korean military jams the radio communication signals on the video to prevent the messages from getting through. So all of this, I think, are a few reasons why I believe that people should really take time to look at this documentary. So do you guys have any other recommendations as well? Or, um, um, or? Something I do want to mention, um, Joseph just talked about Charles Jenkins. So. Charles Jenkins was an American soldier during the Korean War, and he actually defected to North Korea mm -hmm. and was there for many years. So that's just an added fact. Um, but what I would recommend is reading this book called The Invitation Only Zone. Um, it goes into detail about the Keoru Hazuki case, and it gives readers more insight into the conditions abductees face. And it's told in a story manner so I think it's very easy to follow along, easy to understand, and easy to grasp what these people are experiencing on a different level. I feel like Taken's an amazing report, and you should read that too, but this one is almost like a novel, and it's very easy to understand, and it also gives historical background on Korea and Japan, so that's very help helpful too. Mm. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, so I actually chose another HRNK uh, report called March for Life, Songbun, North Korea Social Class Classification System. Um, it's a publication produced in 2012 by Robert Collins um, about North Korea's classification system and how it impacts North Korean citizens' lives in the country. And the reason why I chose this one and how it relates to our topic today is because, again, many of those intellectuals that um, North Korea abducted um, they were actually put in the lower classes of Songbun because the North Korean regime eventually saw them as a threat because, you know, they lived lives outside of the regime. Mm. Thank you, Amanda. And finally, Sumi, do you have any recommendations? Yeah, so I think the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan has like a great resources because they upload a lot of um, news about um, stories between like, Japan and North Korea and other important issues that people can look into. And definitely check out the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea's articles. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your recommendations. And to wrap things up for today, um, Julia, Amanda, and Suin, do you have any last thoughts you want to share with our audience um, before we end our episode? Yeah. Um, by reading HR and K's report taken, my eyes are open to acts that I couldn't even imagine. Uh, I was actually not aware that North Korean abducted people before I read the report. Like, I had no idea. Uh, when I was browsing through HRNK's uh, numerous reports, I saw Taken, and I'm like, that one like looked really interesting to me. And, and when I was reading it, I was just shocked about all the information that we have on these abductions and the fact that they even exist. And But I will say it does make me want to work harder to help the rights of North Korean people and maybe further investigate the abductions of various citizens. Thank you, Julia. Amanda? Yeah, I, I share the same sentiment as, as Julia. You know, every time I, I learn more about um, North Korea and their human rights violations, I, I am shocked every time. Um, and one thing I would want to take away after specifically reading Taken is that um, while we have mentioned stories and have um, talked about specific people, I wanted to acknowledge that so many stories are being left untold or unfinished. 
Um, the Kim regime must be continuously held accountable and must acknowledge their wrongdoings. I hope that in the future, these untold and unfinished stories are brought to light. Yeah, I'm really glad that um, we were able to um, perform this podcast because this is, of course, a very important issue to share as it is still um, a big issue that is unknown and it is really great that we are able to share this news um, to the world. Thank you, Sumin. And with that, Julia, Amanda, Sumin, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, For ending comments, we just want to note, again, what Amanda touched on is that there could be more abductors out there that we're not aware of not covered by the press, government fact-finding missions, or reports produced by organizations like us. On a sombering note, anyone can be a North Korean abductee whisked off a beach or from a walk back home whenever it suits the Kim leadership's interest. This is one more reason why we should be more vigilant in spreading awareness of human rights violations in North Korea. And that said, we hope to see you soon, and thank you for tuning in so far. This was the episode Disappeared from HRNK Podcast Series. <웃음> 고생했습니다. <웃음> <웃음> <웃음>